Good day, everyone, and welcome back to the 2022 Diesel Expo. I'm uh, Nate Brunig with the Lion Power Diesel Forward. And it's a pleasure to uh, bring on our next guest here, uh, who has 31 years of experience in the industry. He's taught various diesel engine trainings in the past. Uh, you may know, have even attended some of his courses. And uh, um, go ahead and welcome uh, Tony Salas. Go ahead and take it away. You'll be talking about Ram Cummins topics for the 6.7 today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having us. I would like to thank the Lion Power and Diesel Laptops for having me speak today. We got a lot of meat to chew today, so hopefully we will be uh, keeping you guys interested in uh, diagnostics. But let's get one thing clear. Anytime we talk about diagnostics, uh, you know, we got to know the system. So my teaching philosophy has changed a little bit in the last few years because you can't really uh, understand anything or diagnose anything if you don't know it, you know. Knowing this power and the saying that I've been saying for years has been, you know, isn't it fun to work on something when you know how it works? So one of the things we did in our description here as I move over to my next slide has been, you know, we, we said in this one hour presentation is talk about diagnostic scenarios. Uh, yeah, I deal with them. As a matter of fact, right now at the shop, I have a 2014. We're doing an exhaust manifold. Well, I'm doing the exhaust manifold. So I'm a pretty much a one man show right now. And I still do jobs. I still work on them, diagnose them. I had like, you know, how many, it was 7.3 season these last two weeks. I was doing a lot of 7.3s. And all of a sudden, this Ram Cummins came about. So, uh, you know, a lot of things to cover. But again, you cannot understand something unless you know how it works. Mike Ruffin did an awesome job of pretty much going over some of the issues going on with Common Rail. Same thing applies with the Ram Cummins 6.7. But the, one of the biggest things that uh, 6.7 Cummins has not seen has been piezo common rail injectors. So in this case, it's all been solenoid style injection system. They've been using the CP3 pump, went over the CP4, but went back to the CP3 for those of you that don't know. I'm sure most people do know, but in this case, that has changed. Like Mike said, let's get it out of, out of the get-go. Um, from my experience, the CP4 pump, okay, has been issues with air and low lift pump pressure. I would say that 50% of the trucks I diagnose with the 6.7 Cummins, and this is stuff that I do in shop, okay? It's not something I make up where I just teach all the time. And that has been the fact that, you know, we need to check the basics. Every time I've talked about common rail has been talking about the low pressure system to the high pressure system, and then there's a return system. So you have to know how they function and how to test. Through time, we have come up with some short uh, cuts that we you know, developed. Now, the biggest issue going on with, uh, you know, the Cummins has been, you know, the uh, ability to do bidirectional testing or bidirectional testing has been an issue. So with that, um, you know, bidirectional testing is very limited. It would be nice if I could go ahead and ramp up the pressures, you know, and what I mean by that is like on a 6.7 power stroke, I can raise and lower the pressures. I can do that on a, on a Duramax too as well. So in this case on a Cummins, no can do about the biggest feature you've got to use on bi-directional control is pretty much a cylinder balance test you know that's been the biggest thing so again we got to know the systems as we talk about diagnostic tips is you got to have a structured approach when you approach a drivability problem you know do you have diagnostic trouble codes that aid you do you not have diagnostic trouble codes that aid you you know that all depends but it all starts with a diagnostic approach you know and that diagnostic approach means you know what i'm always going to check first second you heard Mike Ruffing talk about death fluid, you know, in the fuel. There are now kits sold out there that actually will allow you to test the fuel, see if there's any evidence of death fluid in the fuel. So let's keep that in mind, you know. So therefore, you might want to look into that, too, when you remove the fuel filters and to see what's going on. And it's funny because you'll see a picture of the fuel system later on as I move through my slides. And you're going to see that uh, we actually have... Um, uh, pictures of that everybody forgets that there or they don't know that there is a filter right next to the spare tire on some of the Cummins trucks out there that are 2013 2014 and later so in this case you can have two filters so the early Cummins 6.7 which started in 2007 model year only had that cartridge style filter located where it's always been on Cummins 5.9 and 6.7 on the side of the engine but when we get drivability problems we talk about tips is you know one thing is to build pressure and to build pressure, you got to have, you know, your lift pump pressure volume. You know, Cummins has always talked about doing a volume test average of one liter for 30 seconds. So you can disconnect the line coming into the pump, get creative on making adapters. And at that point, you can measure volume. Again, 
Average one liter in 30 seconds is what you're looking for. Now, it does not make sense. Like I said already, you know, know the three sides of the common rail, low pressure, high pressure, and return on these commons, like any common rail. And that is, you know, you got to measure the lift pump pressure and volume. But then if you're not building rail pressure, you got to do return tests. And I'll tell you my shortcuts that I've developed with doing some kind of return test, which I call a pressure drop test, you know, so therefore that'll help you, but know the system. So as you can see on the slide, we pretty much have the low pressure going through the filters, then to the CP3 pump on these earlier models and to the later models, and then going to the rail and then going to the injector. Mike Ruffin had stressed to you about those uh, tubes right there. And those tubes between the lines and the injectors that go through the cylinder head do have also a filter located in them. So don't forget about that. But it all starts with some of the basics, you know. We have seen issues with uh, gentlemen not knowing that a lot of these 2000, ever since 2007, there was the proper installation of the pump. You know, on the shaft, there was a 750 or 754, and you were supposed to line the five to a prospective position. So in case you don't know, obviously, I'm not going to go over it, but you, this is a part of a service manual procedure that calls for you to bring the engine to TDC, top dead center, and to go ahead and, you know, go ahead and line up the shaft. So again, you won't have an off idle diesel knock. That's what you're trying, which is all part of harmonics. We've discussed this in other classes, but just be aware of that too. So the other thing is, you know, what diagnosis you need to remember? Well, contamination, you know, Mike also talked about this and, you know, had I known he was going to cover some of this stuff, I would not put in my slides, but it's a good review for you. And in this case is contamination. How clean is the fuel system, you know? So in this case, make sure that you test fuel. It is amazing how many technicians will replace injection pumps, injectors, the high cost. Let's face it, they're not cheap for good quality parts, good quality parts. And in this case, it's amazing how, you know, you will replace those components without even take a second glance at looking at fuel. You know, fuel is a problem sometimes. Here in Las Vegas, where I'm located at, fuel can be a problem, you know. And in this case, that problem that I'm meaning is that what good quality of fuel are we taking? Like I've taught in my classes, one thing we like to do is take samples of fuel from different fuel stations. We, had, we do it at least every three months. I just did it recently after one of my diesel master courses. And boy, that was good revelation on the quality of fuel that is sold out there. So uh, be aware of that. In other words, quality of fuel is very important because it'd be very sad for you to replace an injector or a pump or whatever you're replacing in the fuel system and find out that fuel is your problem. Even such things as excessive water might be in the system as well. So the other thing is, like I have mentioned already, and Mike talked about this too, has been the CP4 pump. So in this case, the CP4 pump, which is on these Cummins for two years. And in this case, uh, what you need to know is, you know, Mike didn't recommend it. Other, other people don't recommend it. Manufacturers don't tell you to actually do the change. If Obviously, you're going to do what you're going to do, but always remember the peak pressures that are compared between the CP4 and the CP3 pump because the CP4 does out displace the CP3 injection pump. But like mentioned again, and maybe this is repeated to you, but always remember air is your biggest enemy. So one of the things you definitely want to do is cycle the key several times or use the scan tool to energize the pump because you can do that on a Cummins 6.7. You can energize the pump and run it. Some of them have a kickout timer on them, which goes about 10 to 15 seconds. If not, do it several times. But in this case, after you fire up the truck, the best thing to do is just let it idle for 10 to 15 minutes. Just let it idle, let it work out its air, because again, we don't want to destroy or hurt that CP4. Now, just to get some matters clear, I have customers, I have trucks on vehicles that I take care of. And in this case, you know, we've been running the CP4 and it's doing fine, no issues. It's where they don't do the proper maintenance or do it correctly, okay? That actually cause the demise and destruction of that CP4 pump. Because let's face it, there are trucks in excess of 200, 300,000 miles out there that are actually still running the CP4 pump. So kind of tells you what's going on. So yes, I do know that some of you want to go ahead and uh, change it back to a CP3. That's fine. You're going to do what you're going to do. But here is the modified version on the 2020 truck here that you can see there. So, But what has continually changed with the later models of the Cummins 6.7 has been the fuel filter elements. Obviously, you want to keep it clean as possible. This is a truck that I was working on, and you can see that, you know, it gets dirt and grime all over. Follow the proper procedures, and in this case, that proper procedure en enables you to or tells you to drain and then take the, cu the filter cap off. It is not fun to take off. You got to get creative with a socket or if you got the tool. 
but in this case, torque it properly and change the filter. There has been a lot of talk about, you know, do I use aftermarket filters? There has been some talk about that. I always have ordered OE and filters at this time with the later model 6.7s. So in this case, I can't really make an opinion, but we have seen some restrictions or some flow issues, but that was all because of the contamination found that the filter collected. So, but again, we cannot stress enough about don't diagnose a drivability common rail fuel issue if you haven't confirmed and, and taken a look at the low pressure side of it. So definitely want to do that in, in your diagnosis. So there's your older style. That is the older style filter that we see there. And then again, there is your uh, underhood primary fuel filter on the 13 and later model. Uh, please note, always inspect them, check the water content, especially got water. And if you replace a filter and that filter gets prematurely clogged or dirty again, causing drivability issues, at that point, you need to look at the tank there. So therefore, don't forget what's in the fuel tank too as well. In other words, water, death, whatever that might be. Because let's face it, the customer isn't always going to be honest about telling you if they mistakenly put that fluid in the tank. Which brings up another point before I move forward to the FCA. And that is, you know, if you take time to educate your customer, tell them what death fluid is about. Because I get questions with people with older trucks, like a 5.9 Cummins or early 6.7s that did not have SCR with the death fluid. You know, they're like, should I be using death fluid? Because, you know, define death fluid diesel exhaust fluid. So, you know, they're not making the connection that this is part of an SCR assembly. They don't know what all those components underneath the dash are all about. So all they know is that it's bad, it's not good, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, some of us have to keep these trucks legal. So therefore, you know, we have to have those systems built in. In other words, educate your customer on what's going on. The next thing is the FCA. Like the 5.9, the 6.7 does use a fuel control actuator, also known as the M-Prop from uh, Bosch. In this case, this is the guy that actually regulates your volume going into the injection pump. And in this case, that can cause rolling idle issues. Uh, if you compare that to Duramax with the LB7 LOIs and later, there was a test you can graph on a Tech2 scan tool while, you know, on the software that you have with Cummins, whether using a, you know, a WI Tech scan tool or using some kind of generic aftermarket, whatever you might be using, one of the hardest things to do or to to test is rolling idle issues. And when I take about when I talk about rolling idles, I'm talking about where the truck's going up and down, up and down the RPM. It's just rolling. Nine out of ten times we have found out that it is the fuel control actuator or the M props. And I'll be honest with you, I keep one now in stock in my toolbox. And if a truck comes in with a rolling idle or it's got a P0088, what we usually do is, and by the way, P088 is high rail pressure. And in this case, that means it's not controlling the rail pressure correctly. So in this case, we actually quickly slap on a FCA because it's located right there on the driver's side the, on the injection pump. Easy to get to, no problem. And if that goes away, that makes life a lot easier. So, yeah, I'm not a big guy about us changing parts. Don't get me wrong. But due to the diagnostics and all the headaches to connect, it's easier just to put another FCA that I keep in stock because a lot of these part numbers work across the board. So they, in other words, on different injection pumps, they work. So CP3, CP3, obviously CP4, CP4, right? So there you go. But in this case, it's getting stuck or sticky. Always remember, for the longest time, we've been telling you to look at the FCA duty cycle average between 30 to 35 percent you can look at because it is normally what? It is normally open. And in this case, when it's energized, the PCM, ECM, as ever you want to call it, ECM, is consistently pulsed with modulating it to regulate your rail pressure. So in this case, uh, always remember, though, that uh, when you look at common rail on these common 6.7, you know, up to, what is it, 2019, 2020? I, I got to look at 2022 models. But they've always used only one control here, which has been this FCA, also known as the M-Prop. Unlike Power Stroke 6.7 and Duramax, we have seen some type of solenoid or volume, excuse me, pressure control valve on the rail. Cummins has not used that. They have used a pressure relief valve. So I got to look at newer ones, but I haven't had a chance. The newest one I've worked on has been a 2020. So it's been a while. But all I'm saying is that, one control for rail pressure. So like we've discussed in drivability diagnostics in the past, always look at your set point rail pressure and look at your actual rail pressure, even under cranking conditions to know what's going on. Because a very frustrating phone call I always get is, hey, Tony, what is the minimum rail pressure that I should see 
when I'm doing a crank no start. You know, it's like whatever it actually the set point is or it desires. So keep that in mind. The fuel rail pressure sensor is another guy that's very important. So in this case, the rail pressure sensor, like the 5.9 to the 6.7, you know, it is a diaphragm style that changes resistance. So therefore, it does, again, monitor that rail pressure. Like I just said, you're looking at the actual rail pressure. And that sensor itself, like you can see an early model here, has been really reliable. It has a output voltage of 0.5 to 4.5 volts. But one thing I've learned now, OK, one thing I've learned now with these has been to actually put them on a scope or a meter to watch to see if the voltage does actually derive or actually goes away. In other words, as the rail pressure is changing, OK, that rail pressure is changing, that voltage is going to be varying between 0.5 to 4.5. Can it all of a sudden skew to zero or skew up to five volts to reference voltage? Yes, it can. So one of the things that uh, you can do is to monitor that signal voltage. You could do it on the scan tool, but the scan tool may not capture it at the refresh rate that it works. So that's why, again, I recommend using, you know, your meter to actually test that. Obviously, when you look at scan data, you can look at the sensor voltage. Obviously, make sure you're not in a default uh, value. That's why when you have looked at PID data, like you see here on the screen here, you were always able to view signal voltages coming here. So here we can see the fuel rail pressure sensor set point is 4772.35 PSI, and the actual sensor is reading 4765. They're never right exactly on, and if they are exactly on all the time, that's telling you you're probably looking at a default value. That's why it's a good point to also monitor the signal voltage, which in this case is 1.14 volts. So in other words, when you're doing diagnosis, don't just monitor the set point rail pressure, the actual rail pressure, but also monitor your signal voltage to make sure you're not in a default value or it's not skewing. But if in doubt, you know, obviously always monitor it with a meter or a scope to look at what that voltage does. Very important to do that. So there are codes. Yes, I know about codes. And in this case, always remember what a code is. A code is a test that has failed. So obviously, if you've got rail pressure sensor high, sensor low, too low, too high, obviously, is it an electrical problem or is it a actual fuel rail pressure issue? So in this case, it's important to acknowledge the codes because it is going to be your telltale of knowing what's going on. But like I said at the beginning, don't get codes right away. In this case, do the basic checks, you know, see what's going on under the hood, at least open the hood, you know. So therefore, very important to do that. Now, as we compare a 5.9 to a 6.7, and I'll look at a 6.7 here in a second, for the longest time, Cummins has been using some type of pressure relief valve. Now, that fuel pressure relief valve was designed to open when pressure exceeded somewhere on early models over 27,000 PSI. But this has been a problem, child. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't believe in changing things, but sometimes, you know, when you see these kind of issues, you know, you kind of get a little bit uh, frustrated. And what I mean by that is, if I had a 5.9 Cummins, which I also can use that information on a 6.7 Cummins, you know, I would have low rail pressure, and then we would take the banjo fitting where the arrow's pointing at right there. We would take the banjo fitting off and crank the engine over and see if there was any evidence of diesel fuel oozing out or squirting out, you know. And if it did, that immediately told us that the pressure relief valve was leaking. So as I look at a pressure limiting valve, which is, you know, item number 10 there on the screen, that is where your pressure limiting valve is. And in this case, we take the banjo fitting off again, and we also look to see if we have pressure, you know, or any kind of fluid coming out of there, meaning diesel fuel. So in this case, you're going to make sure it's not leaking because I would, I have caught the pressure limiting valve leaking under a load. So in this case, if I see any, any evidence, any evidence coming out of that banjo fitting, in this case, that's telling me we're probably leaking, you know. So why am I telling you earlier about not changing things? Well, Often what we do is we actually use aftermarket plugs because they have been an issue, these pressure limiting valves, especially if these trucks are really pushed very hard, in other words, abused, you know, we tend to actually hurt the pressure limiting valve or you're running some kind of tuners. Tuners will do that. And what a tuner companies often tell you to do is to put some type of plug. So many of us that put plugs do that in nature, you know, so it's okay to do that. But what, why is this that we're telling you about this as a tip? Is because always remember, if you got low rail pressure or intermittent low rail pressure codes and drivability issues, one of the guys we go after is the actual 
pressure limiting valve. So let's not forget about that guy there located on the 5.9 and on the 6.7. Another guy that's available that can cause low rail pressure issues that many people don't talk about has been the cascade valve. Okay, the cascade valve has been an issue. So as you can see, we're, pin, we're pointing there to the cascade valve. The cascade valve in, in basic terms is actually these, these, excuse me, designed to regulate the crankcase pressure in the injection pump. Look at it that way. So in this case, uh, that has been a little bit of an issue where we got a high return. So in this case, one of the things you can do when you have low rail pressure, you know, and it's sad when guys will actually put injectors in a system or they do the pressure limiting valve. And next thing you know, they still got low rail pressure under load, you know, especially under load. And in many cases, it's the cascade valve. So in this case, that could be stuck open, causing excessive return on the pump. So one of the things you can do is you can do a return test on the actual injection pump. So in this case, if we look at like, for example, in an old diagram here that Bosch used to come out with, you know, we could see that there is a return test that actually is 1000 milliliters that you're supposed to see, I believe it was in one minute. So therefore you can do a return test. Sorry, my, I'm not wearing my glasses because these glasses do reflect a lot. So therefore we can, uh, Sorry, but there it is, <laughs> and you'll be able to view it later. So, But anyways, uh, yeah, you can do a return test in case you suspect a cascade valve. I'll be honest with you, I've kept a few cascade valves off of some pumps, and in this case, it wasn't surprising for me to put another cascade valve. So, yeah, I'm guilty of actually keeping some cascade valves when I send them back for core. But then again, when they rebuild them, they put a new one in it. So, therefore, there you go. So, it is important, again, for you to, and your diagnosis, like I say in the slide and I said before, is to always confirm what is the desired and what is the actual set point of the fuel rail pressure so you know what's going on. And that fault diagnosis that you can get from the codes will help you understand better what you're doing for. But, you know, what is the biggest problem we have? Well, since Cummins has been using the ball and seat injector, you know, for the longest time, Mike Ruffin showed you some awesome pictures of some seats that are hurt because what is the Achilles heel of this injector that Cummins still uses to the day? And that is, you know, the ball and seat erosion. And that's what Mike had mentioned to you on the early, earlier presentation. So as you can see there, you know, that ball and seat is controlling pretty much the nozzle as it lifts. So one of the oldest tests we used to do on 5.9 was to do a snap test. And in this case, you snap the throttle if the RPM stayed high and then came back low after you snapped the throttle with the pedal. You know, that immediately told you you probably had ball and seat erosion on the, you know, on the ball and seat. So therefore, a lot of it has to do with fuel. So Mike also had mentioned about uh, fuel additives. And in this case, those fuel additives are very important, more than ever. Because let's face it, you know, we see 15 parts per million as the specified diesel fuel that is recommended. So when you look at that, that is the, you know, maximum allowable sulfur content. But did you know that fuel does not have a minimum standard? So it isn't surprising that you actually see, you know, slime, for example, the algae growth in fuel. And immediately when you see algae, algae growth in fuel, you know, that's telling you that the sulfur content is probably very low. In this case, that tells you the quality of fuel is not the greatest. So different parts of the country, you know, it has different consistency. In other words, the quality of the fuel is not always the same. So that's the problem. And since I'm in Las Vegas, we're kind of a transient area, and it isn't surprising to get trucks from different part, different states. And let me tell you, the fuel has a lot to be desired in certain areas that I won't name. But in this case, we have seen that with the fuel testing that we have done. So therefore, yeah, that's been a problem. So therefore, more than ever, with the inconsistencies with fuel, it is recommended to run some kind of fuel additive, especially a lubricant or a cleaner. That is very important to run to keep the nozzles clean and also to keep that ball and seat lubricated. So always keep that in mind. So there you go. Now the solenoid, as you can see, is in charge of controlling the seating of that ball in order to have a return and create a pressure differential above and below that nozzle. And that's what we see on Cummins. So the problem is when you're dealing with a Cummins 5.9 or 6.7 that uses the same ball and seat design, the question begs, you know, how do I know one injector has more return than the other? Well, one thing I have done on my own testing is has been to do a pressure drop test. And what I mean by that is we've created a, you know, if you ever look at a, a you know, a, a 
some type of, you know, gauges where you can actually, that we've created, where we actually have gotten a, a line and we put the line on the rail. So we literally will disconnect the line between the injection pump and the rail and we'll put our line on it and we'll actually apply air pressure. Now we use clean shop air. In this case, we apply air. You can use nitrogen. And what we do is we open the valve and we actually apply pressure to all of the rail and all of the injectors. And we close the line to trap that pressure towards the injectors. If the pressure drops immediately, that's telling us we're leaking, okay? So where can that leak be at? It could be at one of the ball and seats of the injector, poor seating of the tube against the injector, or finally the pressure relief valve could be leaking. So in this case, this has been a good way to isolate. So at that point, we can go to each injector and do a pressure drop test, or we can start capping to see which one it is. So caps are still necessary if you want to do it that way as well. So this kind of tells you the integrity of the ball and seat. And the reason why we do this pressure drop test has been to actually isolate which injector it is without having to take a whole bunch of stuff off. The worst case scenario is taking the injector lines off, which if you've dealt with a Cummins 6.7, those back two injectors or back three are no fun to do, which is uh, say six, seven, and eight are no fun to get to. So not fun at all so therefore pay attention to that so we did see in the earlier model years of the 2007 has been that there has been an iqa code if you've been around this business enough you probably know about that you know there are generic iqa codes that are being you know set in there and they're not correct so in this case please make it a point to check iqa codes every so often when you're doing diagnosis not a huge game changer when it comes to drivability but in this case we need to verify the iqa codes that's the difference between a high quality injector and a poor quality injector, because let's face it, I got one here in town that I won't name that rebuilds injectors and all they pretty much do is just clean them and then give you a little piece of paper with an IQA number that who knows if it's gonna be any good. So therefore be aware of that with IQA codes. But if you are putting in good quality Bosch injectors, make sure you enter that IQA and program it correctly. You know, that is the bright thing, do the job right in other words. So that's what we're looking at. Now, earlier I did mention about the uh, transfer tube. Uh, there's the tube with the filter inside of it. But again, many times, like I just did a class not too long ago where we took our engine and we were reviewing with the guys how to seat that tube with the injectors. And each guy took a turn to get it in there. That's part of the class. And I can't tell you how many guys just did not get it right. They were not getting it right. They weren't following procedures or doing it right. So kind of tells me well, how our a lot of those other technicians that haven't had training, how are they putting these in? Are they leaking a little bit from the tube to the injector mating? You know, that's the question. Now, the reason why you won't see this leak is because it's in the return passage. So therefore, it'll all go to return and you won't see it. So in this case, it's a good idea, like I like to do, a pressure drop test using air, chop air, or using nitrogen, which works pretty well. So. So there, there's a few tips about the common rail, maybe a little bit of redundancy of what Mike Ruffin told you about, but, you know, hopefully it helps you with these. Now, we got to move over. What to know about after treatment? Changing gears, okay? What's going on with after treatment? Well, <laughs> a lot going on with after treatment. Uh, the question is, do you have a DPF issue or do you got an SER issue, right? So you got to see the big picture here. And what is that big picture? Well, I always have taught in my classes that role play yourself as the exhaust and you're at the mercy of whatever's coming down that exhaust too. You know, that downpipe from the turbo, what's coming down there? Is there oil? Is there coolant? Is there excess suit? You know, please note before we even talk about after treatment on these Cummins applications is that it does not make sense for you to diagnose anything if you haven't confirmed on the, excuse me, rephrase. It does not make sense for you to check anything with the after treatment issues if you don't check, you know, that the engine is operating normally, meaning that there's no injector leakage problems, no boost problems, no engine oil consumption problem, nothing. In other words, after treatment always has demanded that the engine run at optimum levels, in other words, running perfectly. And that's something you got to remember. OK, so don't sit there and try to diagnose after treatment issue if you know you got a dead miss. Look at it that way. Or you got fuel rail pressure codes. Don't even bother with that. But what I have taught is, you know, if you have a drivability problem, let's say a common rail turbo problem, and that's going to cause effects with the after treatment. And that's the hardest part of today's diagnosis, like the Cummins 6.7 on these Ram trucks, has been 
I tell the customer, you know, Mr. Joe Smith, whatever your name is, you know, I have to first fix your drivability problem. And then I have to go ahead and see how it affected your after treatment system. Okay. That's something you, you can't do a diagnosis, especially if it's a crank, no start, and you got no real pressure. And the reason why I won't start, because once I get it fired up, I got to make sure it's running on all six. And then I have to check to see if the turbo is boosting okay. And then afterwards, I got to see if there's any effects on these drivability problems that the after treatment is putting on the engine itself. So they kind of crisscross with each other, you know. And what I mean by that is, can I have low rail pressure? The engine running low power with a restricted after treatment system. Yes. That's why I've also said, let's go ahead and disconnect that downpipe and let it run open. Let's uncork the exhaust and let's see how it runs. So that's going to tell you a whole heck of a lot of the condition of that after treatment system. So keep that in mind. Yes, you're going to have diagnostic trouble codes. But again, you need to verify that that exhaust system is not giving you headaches also, meaning it's restricted, causing excess back pressure. And that's something you've got to check very important to do so so the other thing we have is a lot of guys don't understand the lights and the messages first thing before i go into this always remember i have learned the hard way you gotta understand some of the trucks that i get have excess of three hundred and fifty thousand miles i mean i got some tow trucks that i take care of and those are the roughest beat up trucks i've ever dealt with and they can have three hundred sixty thousand miles on them and you know sometimes things don't work according to plan age has done its toll on them i don't know how to explain it but one of the things you always want to confirm is does the truck have the latest flash file in it always remember when you're dealing with after treatment no with ups and butts i'm sorry to say that i know it's a pain in the butt i have to call it bad actually reflash because i can't justify the cost because i don't do enough rams to actually justify the cost but he program for me, programs them for me and you know sometimes we got to get that especially when you got that message let me skip back here for example, I will get trucks. Like, take a look at that screen. I will get trucks that will come in, and it says, you know, the exhaust filter is 90%, 100% full, and it says it's running regeneration. I know it's not running a regeneration because it's a cold start. It's not going to run a regeneration when it's cold start, okay? So in this case, I know that's false. So I will do everything to run a regeneration, but in many cases, you require a code 1451 to run a regen. So what do you do? You know, what do you do? You can't, if you don't have the 1451 code, you can't run a regeneration. Sometimes it'll let you run it. Sometimes it doesn't. It's not consistent. Okay. That's one thing I've learned about this software. Okay. It sucks. I'll say it. It sucks sometimes because it's not always the way the book says. I'll be honest with you. This has been one of the most aggravating ones. It's been to the point that in order for me to get rid of that message that you see on this screen on my slide presentation has been to reflash the whole computer. Now, here's where it gets interesting. I've had a few trucks now and I've had a few phone calls where I've told people, that we will reflash it once and it'll still display that message. And it'll take up to three reflashes on the same file. Yes, I'm saying this. And you can either believe me or not, it doesn't matter. But this is what I've had to do, do to fix them. Where I had to reflash it several times in order for it to actually get rid of that message and allow me to do a regeneration. But then I got to monitor on what's going on with the system itself. Do I, clog, do I have a clogged SCR, a clogged PPF? What's going on? You know, there's a lot more to the picture. But if you do have this light on, and in this case, that light is on, what you can do is you can assimilate what this light means. This light has always meant that you do have some kind of NOx problem, you know, and you could be in D rate. That could be an issue. Maybe you're at five miles an hour, and that's the biggest aggravation that customers have. So in this case, you know, you need to look at the, you know, the messages. So is it possible you can have no check engine light? but you can have this light on. So this tells you that there is an adequate NOx reduction or it hasn't been able to test to see that there is adequate NOx reduction. Do you understand that? So the question is, do you have a check engine light or do you not have a check engine light? So when I look at information here, like for example, on this truck here that I took, this is off a live truck that I diagnosed. You know, I was derated. I did have a check engine light on. And I also had codes. So in this case, I had to go look at the codes, you know. So here's another truck. And if you've been to my uh, YouTube channel, there was one that uh, we had a pump problem. We weren't creating pressure. So in this case, you know, you're going to get this kind of message. Uh, check engine lights on. And we also got the message displaying that it is derated at this time. So number one is you got to look at the code to see what's going on. 
erase the code and then see what actually comes back. You know, let's see, because the code is always testing, always take advantage of that within the code, especially when you're dealing with SCR issues. At that point, okay, I'm going to follow the code chart. So that's the next step a lot of guys don't do is they don't read the code chart. So on one of these scenarios, I had these codes set. I had consistently a P208A, which was reductant pump, control circuit open. Obviously, this is a three-phase pump. How do I know this? Well, I pulled up the code. I looked at the code and see what's going on. So, you know, if you're trying to get ahead on this kind of thing and diagnosing, being a better technician at diagnosing this instead of just slapping parts, you know, read on these diagnostic trouble codes because Lord knows as I teach, I got to read and read and read. And, you know, it doesn't take that long to take time to read. I actually spend more time trying to find and get to the code than I am reading, believe it or not. But that's another thing I also mention is if you're not sharp on your Identifix, your all data, your Mitchell, I mean, whatever, your pro demand, you know, you got to get fast in it to know where to get to it faster than the best way you can possible. So then you can pull up these codes and reduce your diagnostic time because yeah, sometimes it takes a while, but it has actually bailed me a lot, you know? So, but anyways, uh, we did have a bad pump, but one of the things you can look at is also knowing what's available on your PID list. In this case, I can see here that I got, you know, 86.1 PSI and it's telling me the state, it's actually dosing. Dosing means to inject the death fluid into the exhaust. So that's all viewable. Even though I don't have a whole heck of a lot of, you know, bi-directional control, I can still view what is the action that the computer is taking to actually help me diagnose that. So, yes, we see that. But there's other data available. As you can see, some of my screenshots that I did here off of my Snap-on Zeus. In this case, you can see, you know, the pressures. I'm looking at the dosing rate. I can also look at the parts per million of NOx. So one of the things that has been an issue has been what is too much NOx and what is too little NOx, which unfortunately due to time constraint, that's part of a course, but that's something we got to ask ourselves, what is too much NOx, what is too little NOx? Because some trucks, unlike the Ram Cummins, will set codes for excessive NOx on NOx sensor one, which is the one before the after treatment. So what's going on there? Obviously you can set for, you know, inadequate NOx reduction codes that can actually be set. So here we can see zero. So I took this truck around the block a few times and this is what I was getting. So we were getting zero. So the question is what happens when you get readings of minus values? So again, another thing we got to confirm along with looking at your temperature of the exhaust, because as you know, you know, your after treatment requires heat, you know, requires those light off temperatures to be attained. Very important to look at. And at the same time, you can view what is going on with your SCR. What is the status of your SCR? But don't bother looking at SCR, you know, none of your death fluid stuff. If you haven't confirmed that you're eventually building pressure, like I just showed you earlier, of 86.1 PSI that we saw there. So if you're reading 12 to 13 PSI, that usually means zero because it's reading atmospheric pressure never goes to zero. So therefore, always remember that. So here you can see from the bi-direction controls, what can I do? The lift pump relay, I can turn on and off, count engine off. And that's pretty much what you got along with the intake air throttle and the fan clutch. I kind of laugh at the fan clutch one because I can't control the fan clutch while the engine's got RPM. So to me, that's a useless test. So, but in this case, I'm just showing you what's available from Ram Cummins. But if I look at the book and I look at what's going on or the tests are available for the SCR system, there's one biggie one that we need to focus and that is the catalyst efficiency test. This is a beautiful thing that Parstroke 6.7 does not have, that Duramax does have. And in this case, that is the catalyst efficiency test. The catalyst efficiency test is something you can actually select. And in this case, this allows you to tell the computer, hey, Mr. Computer, what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and test to see if there's adequate NOx reduction. So it's a meaning, you can say a regeneration, but its sole purpose is to monitor the actual performance of the NOx reducing system, which is the SCR. So if I have a light on or I just did a repair and I'm still in D-rate, one of the things you may have to do is perform a catalyst efficiency test. And that is to tell the computer, hey, test to see if there's proper NOx reduction. It does require to have the temperatures up to speed and make sure that they're all warmed up. So therefore, always remember, that's a great test to have. That's a good thing, especially when you've done a repair Let's say you replaced a reductant injector, you reduced, uh, maybe you replaced a knock sensor and so on. Catalyst efficiency might be next on your list. Now, here's the thing. 
you're going to run a catalyst efficiency test. And this is what I despise of today's scan tools, is that there's nothing that tells you whether or not it passes or fails. The only way you'll know is the light or the reduction in speed, the D rate is kicked out. You have to look at the dash itself. So nowhere on the scan tool does it show pass or fail. It just runs a test. So the question begs, okay, it's been running for 30 minutes, been running for 45 minutes, an hour. Still nothing, right? I have learned now, and this is something I'm giving you as something that I've learned. If it hasn't kicked out a D rate or it hasn't actually, um, you know, it, it get rid of the code, after you perform a callous efficiency for 30 minutes, cancel it out and go figure out why you're not actually kicking out. And in many cases, this is why I said this at the beginning, many times I've had to go ahead and reflash the computer. So keep that in mind. Okay. All right. Moving on. Burning time here. Good. Uh, the reason why I showed you this pick, it's it's impossible unless you take the truck bed off or drop the tank. But that module you see right there on top of the tank is actually your DCU, your dosing control unit. So that dosing control unit works with the PCM, and he's the one that controls directly, again, the pump itself. So as you can see, the pump is providing the depth pressure going to the depth fluid injector, and your job is to go ahead and do a volume test to see if you have adequate depth fluid being injected. So there is a specified amount, which is 85 to 115 millimeters from the service information. So if you don't have adequate NOx reduction, a key thing to look at if the code leads you to it or you need to check, is to always measure the volume of DEF fluid coming out. It's not fun to do, but it's something you have to do with the scan to make sure you don't have a clogged or restricted DEF fluid injector or doser, as they call it. You also are going to make sure you got a spray pattern and also gives you an opportunity to take a sample of that DEF fluid and see if it's good quality DEF fluid. So you're going to use the refractometer and you're going to use the Test strips actually test to see if there's any other contamination. So very important to do. Okay. A lot more to chew with the SER, but something you got to keep in mind. A quick switch in gears, the EGR. Yes, it is a NOx reducing device too as well. Well, one of the nicest things that's been good about these Cummins has been the fact that you can remove this whole EGR, detach the motor from the EGR valve itself, and you can actually clean it and service it and make sure you don't have excess carbon deposits located in the intake. So always remember, you can set EGR codes or intermittent EGR codes, especially position codes, and it could all be due to carbon buildup on it, which we have done many cleans. It requires us to put a new gasket on the base, but in this case, it's been a pretty easy fix. But always check the condition of the tube feeding it because that tube that goes across, which is item number four, has been known to get carbon coke along with the EGR cooler. So, all right, switching gears again. Uh, the variable geometry turbocharger that continues to be a headache. You got to understand, and let me skip a few slides. Let me go over one slide because this is the best I got. When you look at the engine right here on these coming 6.7, please note that when you're running an active regeneration, okay, you're going to actually have excess fuel coming out of that exhaust manifold. And the first guy to get that fuel is the turbo, then turbo to the downpipe, right? So it isn't surprising that turbo will get carbon coated, especially if this truck does a lot of stop and go driving, right? So this car, this turbo will actually get carbon coated. So when you look at uh, different issues with the turbocharger on the 6.7, we see that we'll get codes. You know, sometimes the, the you know, as you can see, the turbo boost control module position exceeded. From my um, experience, it has been that they get stuck or sticky. And in this case, we have taken apart and tried to clean them. And I've been 50%, if not less, successful at actually figuring out the problem with the turbo, meaning that it's just got so much carbon. So when you look at this, you got to bear in mind other things, such as the exhaust pressure sensor. We have seen the tube going to the exhaust pressure sensor get clogged. We have seen also carbon on the uh, little actual orifice underneath it that goes, depending on which 6.7 model you got. That also has been full of carbon too as well. So we have seen exhaust pressure sensors so bad that you'll get no boost. The truck will come in with no boost and it may or may not have a code for exhaust pressure sensor. So bear in that. But as I skip slides here, you know, you see the actual turbo itself. This is one we took apart years ago. But you can see these, these they're not really veins. They're more like windows, I like to call them, that actually close a passage to restrict the passage that creates a pressure to the veins, so therefore it spins faster or slower. 
But we also see, as I move over here, has been that when we remove the actuator, this is an early model actuator, but what we see on the actuator itself, the motor sometimes is burnt. Many of you have gone ahead and replaced the actuator, but sometimes it don't take, it don't want to move because of the fact that when you look at that sector gear on the turbo, we have seen issues with, the, with it being stuck or it doesn't have its full travel. So... The service manual outlines the procedure of doing this. You got to use a proper scan tool to rehome it and have it learn its position. But in this case, understand that what is your biggest enemy is that you're probably been running excess regenerations, which creates a lot of carbon deposits, which causes it to stick, which makes the motor on the actuator actually stick. So therefore, it's going to actually burn it up and you may need a new actuator, but not always will the actuator always work, you know. So yeah, there've been times we've had to sell a whole new turbo to the customer, you know. Another quick thing is, always remember there is a speed sensor, as you can see there. There is a speed sensor on the turbo and that speed sensor is designed to see, it records the speed in the event there is a loss of boost pressure. Now, one of the things I did not put up here on my slides that I actually forgot and I apologize has been a smoke machine. If you haven't invested in a high pressure smoke machine, I highly recommend it because it actually makes life a lot easier so therefore make sure that you actually uh you know make sure you check for uh, any leaks on the intake and you'd be surprised where that smoke might come out so so definitely take advantage of that you know so but as i'm starting to conclude this it is a good idea for you to always know what your system can do so Play around with the truck whenever you get a chance. If you got a good running truck there, look at the numbers, look at the code. Like, for example, here's the main menu on my scan tool. I see my options that I have here. And in this case, you know, what can I can I do? What's available? What are the miscellaneous functions? What are the functional and system tests? So get acclimated and get some speed on the scan tool and get some speed on your service information. And like I started my presentation is know how the system works. So there you go. So there are intermittent things that I get to, and you can see some of my videos also on my Diesel Talk YouTube channel, where we can see intermittent issues here. You can see a frayed wire that was causing us havoc. And in this case, you know, some of my customers like the four wheeling and they forget that a truck is a truck, not a boat, if you know what I'm saying. So in this case, we see corrosion problems, wire hurt problems. So, you know, we got to know the systems themselves. So in this case, what do you do when you got no communication to a specific module and that creates more issues too as well so there you go so that's a series of tips that i can give you here um obviously you know there's more to the picture here more to service information so therefore definitely do some reading like i said um do visit my uh you know my youtube channel um we do have the diesel tg where technicians can actually post their questions where other technicians help technicians we also have the round table you can see all that at our powertrain training website and uh you know, we appreciate it. Uh, I guess I'll hand it over to Nate, where if you should have any questions, you know, definitely contact me at this information on the slide there. So, yeah, Woo! Tony, great. First Love. off, great presentation, and man, you you cruise right through that thing there. So great work. Um, but yeah, there there are a few questions that have come across, and I think we got a few moments here um, to go ahead and ramble them off here for you. So the first question um is have you ever seen a failure within the turbo or control valve due to elevated heat and or excess idle time yes excess idle time yes excess heat means yeah actually we've seen the turbos pretty much destroyed because this customer was driving the vehicle to the point that it was barely moving five ten miles an hour i mean there's some people that literally abuse the trucks they see that it's not getting adequate power and they just keep driving it so it isn't surprising to destroy the turbo. Literally, you see broken parts inside of the turbo, and actually the exhaust is just totally clogged to the point that it needs replacement. Yeah. yeah there's another question on here. Um, 2019 and up uh, Rams use a software security block to prevent scan tool access for non-dealers from what this person has experienced. How would the independent mm -hmm. and fleet shops access different modules to reprogram? For example, TPMS, uh, tire size programming. Yes, uh, I actually came across that when I actually had this, for example, my Snap-on Verus, I actually upgraded to the Snap-on Zeus. 
And one of the things they immediately, when I was working on a 19 truck, had said that about the uh, lockout that I had. Well, fortunately, Snap-on has licensing rights that I was able to. I had to give them a quick call. The guy came out and they did what they did. I don't know what they did, but they actually now enabled it. So I guess it all comes down to the scan tool company. You know, so therefore you want to get a scan tool that actually does give you that feature. Um, there are numerous companies that allow this now. So therefore, you know, because I get guys bringing their scan tool implement classes or, you know, everyday things that I do. So there are some that do lock you out and do some that don't lock you out. So it's, I guess it all comes down to whose scan tool we're talking about because I have access to it. You know, both my, uh, my snap on virus and my other scan tool that I got, you know, they all allow me to get into there. So it's all a matter of their licensing that they provide in terms of reflashing. Um, there are universal reflashes that I do allow. That's all part of the license you pay for. But I got to tell you, after all the costs you have involved, I'm more apt to get the uh, the OE2, which is a WI tech to do that. It saves time and issues and lockup problems, you know, so therefore that's uh, very good. So there are good scan tool support companies out there. As you know, I've been using AE tools. I'm plugging in my guess for them, but in this case, they've been good. You know, they've been helping me, but in this case, there are other companies out there so therefore, it, you just got to shop around and ask other technicians. Like a round table is a good place for you to talk to people. I could tell you what I use. But uh, for a scan tool company not to offer you the ability to reflash on those later models, you say it's because they haven't paid the licensing rights to do that, which you should have by now. Okay, thanks, Tony. Um, another question on here. Do you consider force regeneration during service work if unit if the unit is severe duty application, for example, short run and extended idle times truck is a common six seven used in an ambulance application if it allows you i've always been a, an advocate of if it allows you because like i said already uh, many of the ram software does not allow you unless you got the 1451 set so in this case uh, you can't do it i mean you just can't do it but i've always been advocate hey if you're going to do an oil change wouldn't it be a great idea to run a regeneration just to clean up the DPF, and yes, if you can, I'm a bit advocate about that, but um, in many cases, gone to the point that it won't let me run a regeneration on the RAM coming software, so therefore, we literally have removed it and send it out for cleaning, you know, so. But it also begs the question is, do you know, you know, how to tell if that DPF is loaded by looking at your pressure differential sensor, so. Yeah. Uh, there's another question here. Um... What are the root causes of ball and seat erosion in injectors? Number one cause has been fuel quality. End of story. Fuel quality is the lubrication of the fuel. That has been its biggest problem. And like Mike said also, has been fuel contamination, but mostly is the quality of fuel. That's why, again, we were stressing about using some kind of lubricants once in a while in the tank. But it doesn't hurt you, like I said already, to test your fuel locally. And the one thing, for those of you who've never attended my classes, has been we actually take uh, baby jars and we visit numerous fuel stations around where I'm at. And it, you'd be surprised what we get out of those baby jars after they sit for 24 hours. Sometimes they're all consistent, but sometimes not good fuel. So the lubrication yeah. of the fuel has been the number one cause. All right, we have another one here. It says, uh, when you talked about having to reflash a truck several times for a P1451 issues, are you saying that you had to have the same flash file loaded several times to get issues resolved? They were just curious. No, no, no. Um, they had a customer. It's not the 14. Okay. Yeah, let me let me interrupt you there for a second. It's not the 1451 code. I'm sorry if I, that's what you said. No, 1541 is just allowing me to do a regeneration. However, when I've been in five mile per hour D rate or I'm in an SER issue, there have been times I've had to reflash it. And this truck had, you know, like I said, these trucks had over 200, 300,000 miles on them. And it won't take, it won't lock me out. So the, the condition you're faced after is you're in D rate. And you've repaired the truck, but still the software has got you at five miles D rate. You did the catalyst efficiency test. You did everything you're supposed to. There's no diagnostic trouble codes. And there have been times that I've had to reflash it all those three times, like I said earlier. So it's a question that you're locked in a D rate condition. That's what I meant, not the 1451. The 1451 is just your permission to run a regeneration. Hope that clears it up. Looks like we get another uh, one final one on here. Um, we'll wait a minute after this, too, to see if more come across. But uh, can you use the Snap-on Zeus to check the ECM flash version so you know it's up to date? 
before getting someone to come reflash for you? Uh, the only thing I can see with the Snap-on Zeus is a part number on the flash file. So therefore, I would have to do investigative work on my service information to actually, you know, see if it is the latest flash file, and which is no fun to do. So in many cases, I have to make a judgment call. Says, you know what, I'm not going to look it up. In many, it just it's it takes a long time if you can get the bulletin. So in many cases, been just let's just reflash it, even if it is with the same file, because like I said, I'm just trying to clean the slate, clean the slate of that computer on any learns that I cannot get rid of for some odd reason that. Always been a condition. And if you've been working around with incomes, you know what I'm talking about. It's a headache. So I'm not yes, seeing sir. any other I'm not seeing any other questions coming across right now, Tony, but I do know that you you are exhibiting today at the show. So I'm sure people may have uh, uh, some questions that come up and um, you'll be in the booth at all times today to be able to answer questions. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one though. Yeah, I'll be lying around there and actually watching everybody. Like right now in the last, even when I'm speaking, I've, this thing's gone off. I've had like an excess of 25 visitors already that I could not talk to because I'm here. <laughs> I guess they didn't know I was here. But uh, yeah, the training is here. They're available. Obviously, we have a July 25th diesel master course. And if I may plug this in, I got to tell you, with the competence level of today's technicians, I highly push the diesel master course and it's changed. I mean, the reason why I've changed it is because you got to know how this stuff works. I mean, you got to, there's a lot of, you know, worksheets we got to fill out. The hands on has gone down to a minimum because of the fact that these guys just don't understand, you know, what the service is requiring you to know in diagnosing this. Okay, you got this condition, you got this condition, and the cost of parts is just so high nowadays that you better know that you're replacing the correct part. And time after time here, guys, um, you know, I deal with it daily. You know, people are so stressed. The customer so stressed because they're, you know, they're, they they just have had four shops look at the truck. Now they bring it to me and it's because they just don't know what's going on. So even with the new trucks, you know, same thing. So, so in this, and I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you know, we asked to make the investment in good training. I'm not saying I'm the best, but I like to think I teach some guys. I've been in this business for a long time and hopefully we can help you out there. So. Well, Tony, we're running. There's a few more questions that came across, but I know that we're not going to have enough time to be able to answer all those. And I would highly encourage you to, um, to those of you that stayed on here today, um, you know, visit Tony in the booth, uh, reach on out to him. Um, Tony, thank and you for my being email on too. the show too. Yep. And then, of course, you got his email listed there as well. So um, f feel free to email him with questions. And uh, again, Tony, thank you for being on the on the Diesel Expo today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care, everyone.